But it's just the technology side. You have to invent and innovate in other areas as well. We have 18 investors in our syndicate. Um, uh, about 60% of them are institutional, so they include uh, private equity and venture capital. But the rest are all um, corporate investors or strategics, as Bill would say, and, and we say all the time. Uh, and all of them are ones that we specifically recruited because they were important to our company, either in the vertical or as um, customers or development partners. And so they include not only Dow Chemical, but GE, Sumitomo, Constellation Energy, NRG, ConocoPhillips. It's a wide, wide range of, uh, of investors. But that's not enough. You also have to innovate on the business model. Because we talked earlier, the reward for building a new technology in solar can't be to go compete head to head with a nuclear reactor or a coal power plant. You, you won't survive that. So what we've done is take the attributes of our technology, which is very high energy density and lightweight and flexible, and map it into markets where we can make a difference, right? where we can actually add value and create a new solution, not just replace electrons that are already coming from a different, a different source. So in, in that market, then we look for, for opportunities where there are maybe small markets, but that turn on quickly and that I can capitalize on very early in the life cycle of the company. And then others that have high growth potential, but that will take time to mature and that I have to start incubating and developing now so that four or five or six or seven years from now, I'm in some really big, meaningful markets. So let, let me give you some examples. Unmanned aerial vehicles. This is probably one you would never have thought about. There are tens of thousands, literally tens of thousands, of these little hand-launched UAVs that are in use by primarily the US military, but rapidly other militaries abroad. And uh, they're the size of a model airplane, a couple meter wingspan. They're used for surveillance and communication systems. So most of uh, forward operating base communications is done by establishing an ad hoc network um, that's uh, full broadband of uh, uh, connecting one UAV to another that can span hundreds of miles, and that's how all the communications occurs. The problem with these is that they can only fly for about 50 minutes. So you have to carry a lot of batteries and, uh, or be able to recharge. So what we've been doing is incorporating our flexible films into the wing skins themselves of these uh, aircraft, and that extends the flight time to over four hours. So the mission profile changes entirely. Just now are civil and commercial uh, entities beginning to adopt these type of, um, uh, of aircraft. So this might seem like total niche, don't understand how it can be useful. Well, it creates an entirely new solution that I can supply off of my pilot line. And they'll pay enough, these markets will pay enough that I can actually profitably sell off my pilot line. There's just almost no way to do that into any kind of traditional utility type market. So this is one example, and of course in the military there's flexible charging mats and uh, portable shelters and all sorts of other opportunities that, that are similar. Energy is one of the single biggest problems that the military faces, by the way. But there's other things. What about um, commercial uh, opportunities like mobile devices? Okay, here's a case where there are 5 billion cell phones in use and over 100 million tablets, and we charge them all by plugging into the wall. Why is that? Well, that's because solar cells today just can't generate enough power to provide a meaningful amount of charge. But using our material, the cover of an iPad can generate 10 watts of power in full sun. That's the same amount of power you get from the wall. So even in ambient light and through windows and, uh, and lights, you can generate enough charge to be constantly recharging the battery. So you have a chance at um, uh, being disconnected completely, completely portable on your, on your portable devices. Again, in a country like the US, you know, it's, it's sort of a luxury thing. But what about a, a country like Africa where there is no grid, right? Now it's fundamentally enabling communications and learning and, and a whole variety of other life uh, enhancing opportunities. Um, automotive, even combustion engine vehicles and hybrid vehicles can benefit from having a little bit of low cost solar on the uh, rooftop. And with our type of material, a little bit is two or 300 watts or even more. So, you can offload all of the heavy load appliances like uh, air conditioning and that sort of thing and get a, a boost. And that's important when the cafe standards are really high and, you know, and you're trying to avoid or, or, or defer major redesigns of the powertrain and the combustion engine system. For electric vehicles, even bigger deal because most electric vehicles have an active cooling system for the battery that has to run all the time, especially when the vehicle has been driven, it's put in a hot parking lot and it's not plugged in. Where's that power come from? And it takes 300 watts or so to do that. Well, being able to incorporate a solar film into a stylized glass roof that looks aesthetically beautiful and could provide all that power, 
puts that problem at rest completely. So here's a market that has enormous growth potential, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. But it's automotive, so they don't make decisions very fast anyway. So it's something that we start on now and that we can grow into in the future. So maybe my next plant or even my plant after that will have a market that it can satisfy. And then finally, of course, as, uh, as you notice, all the things I've talked about so far are portable. You're not plugged into a grid at all. But um, uh, you know, if you think about Bill's, uh, Bill's product, the powerhouse shingle, uh, you know, it completely eliminates the balance of system costs associated with the solar installation. There's no racks, there's no wire, there's no specialized labor, and there's no penetrations of the roof. The solar material is incorporated into the roofing material itself. It's, it's actually an amazing approach, and the same thinking can be applied to um, uh, warehouse roofs and other forms of distributed generation. So the point is, you know, this stuff um, is complicated. It takes a long time. The, um, uh, I don't think many of us rely on a landline anymore. And I don't think that centralized energy is going to be the answer everywhere. I think the, um, you know, the important thing for us is to let go of this notion that one solution is going to solve all of our problems and instead focus on being able to test lots of different ideas and figure out how to get some of those ideas to mature long enough that they can begin to approach scale and we can get some sense of what's really got value for the future. So in closing, I guess I'd like to leave you with one thought from uh, Albert Einstein, uh, who, who said the following, you know, we can't solve our problems with the same thinking that we used when we created them. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Well, I, I hope you could see why we love them so much as the anti-cylindra. Um, <laughs> cautious with their investors' money, both uh, strategic in the short term, but looking ahead to the long term, and in a way that delights technology review, uh, committed to actual core defensible IP, the most efficient solar cell on the planet at the moment. It's why they were one of our 2012 breakthrough companies. But there's a long way to go in many challenges. So I guess I'd like to ask, what would have to happen for you to be genuinely contributive at the grid level in the way that plants are now? Yeah, it's, it's really a great question. And, and it's one that you know, even we don't worry about that much right now because you know, there's already almost 100 gigawatts of, of solar installed. And uh, you know, our, our first you know, reasonable size plant would be 40 megawatts. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a, it's a drop in the bucket. So, so what, what we do is we, we focus on perfecting the core elements of the technology. And for things like ours, there's a couple of things that you have to do. You know, first, if you look at the material set, compound semiconductors and gallium arsenide in particular are by far the very best solar uh, or photovoltaic materials if you can find a way to use them cost effectively. So the most important parts of our technology are associated with finding ways to grow these very thin films, make them perform at the level that they can perform. And uh, so we put a lot of focus on that, knowing that you know, what we do will be picked up by others and that you know, from, a, from a global impact point of view, it isn't going to be just my company that can make a difference. It's going to be proving that some of these basic uh, approaches to growing the films or handling them are going to be adopted by others and that's how you, how you get to scale and, and actually make a difference. But I, I think, you know, I think silicon from a, folder, a solar photovoltaic point of view is um, going to be around a very long time. It's, it's had decades of, of, um, uh, of learning from a manufacturing productivity point of view but its performance hasn't changed much in three decades. Uh, and so this it takes a material set change, like what we're doing, to fundamentally transition in performance. And once you do that, I think you can unlock all these other different ways to start to create energy where it doesn't exist now, and it takes the load off of the problem that others are trying to solve, like, like mm -hmm. Nathan described.